Good morning, ladies. So I'm not sure who's going to be able to join in this morning. So I'm going to wait a few seconds and then I'm going to pray in and still do the live. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Miriam. <laughs> Okay, so before I pray in, I always show the products that I'm using for those who will be watching it on YouTube or watching it later on and are new to how I do my Bible journaling. So the first thing I'm going to be using is the ESV Crossway Single Column Journaling Bible. I am only going to be using this for Ephesians because I will be switching back over into using the New King James. But for the Book of Ephesians, we'll be doing the ESV Crossway. I use a number of things to write with. Um, I normally use a micron to write with, but I'm going to be using this big brown stick pen. Um, it's just a blue ink pen. I just feel like blue ink pen looks better versus black ink. I use the Crayola Super Tip markers to highlight, as well as my Zebra Mild Liners. And I use the Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils and Sharpie Smear Guard Highlighters. So I use a number of things to highlight. I know someone said that um, the Pigma, is it the Pigma? No, I don't know. Those really nice professional um, colored pencils, I've, I've heard those are really good to use as highlighters in your Bible. So I'm going to try those out soon. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I use post-it notes to take my notes down. So I just have two here to do my notes and let me just fix the camera a bit here we go but yeah so i will be using the ephesians bible study notes if you do have it if you don't you can just purchase them on the blog um the link is in the group but i'll try to put it in the video description as well but um the process that i do i basically We'll read through the paragraph or the passage, depending on how long the passage is. But normally I would read a paragraph through first and then I would go in and circle words that I want to define. And these are basically words that I do know and words that I don't know. Just anything to define because the Greek definition will always be different. And for the New Testament, it was originally written in Greek. So I would look up the words in Greek. And then after that, I would go in and underline anything um, from the verses that really stand out to me. And once I underline, I then make my notes and then I box everything with color just to make it look fun and bright, kind of like we did with chapter one. So I'm going to just move the sticky note out of my way and just put that over here. Today we'll be diving into chapter two of Ephesians and I titled it God's Way of Reconciliation. So I'm going to quickly just pray us in a quick, simple prayer so we can dive in. It's only going to be 22 verses, I think, today. Yeah, 22 verses, so it's not that long. So I'm going to pray us in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for the operation of our bodies, our limbs, and our lungs, Father God. We are thanking you just for this new day, new mercies, and new grace, Father God. We thank you for the love that you adorn us with. I'm asking that you use me to... Teach this word to your people, Father God. Allow us to be able to grasp something out of this so that we may be able to apply it to our lives, Father God. We invite you into this Bible study and we ask that you just come and dwell with us. Amen. So, quick, simple um, prayer. <laughs> so, I'm going to start off by reading verses 1, 1 through 9? Nope, 1 through 10. So, basically a whole paragraph. So, can you guys see this? I'm going to zoom in a little more. trying to fix this lighting quickly hopefully this works but um let's just dive right in so they're titling this portion by grace through faith so starting off at verse 1 chapter 2 
and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which I'm sorry, because of the great love with which he loved us. Verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So now I'm just going to go in and circle words that I wanted to find. So the first one is going to be passions, which is in verse 3. as well as wrath. I'm going to circle rich in verse four. Verse five, I'm gonna circle dead. Going to verse eight. I'm gonna circle gift. And I believe the last word, actually the last two words are going to be workmanship and walk. I'm just going to grab a post-it. And the first one I'm going to put is passions. I'm going to take this mount liner in this kind of magenta color and circle it and also box it so that they line up. So passions is basically an intense desire, enthusiasm, craving, a longing or lust, sorry, or lust for what is forbidden. So that's what I'm basically going to write. Here's a definition for you guys to see. But an intense, and this I just looked up in the um, English dictionary. I didn't care to look it up in the Greek. Because if I'm not mistaken, I believe in the King James and the New King James, it says lust, if I'm not mistaken. But, um,. Craving. For what is forbidden. The next word is wrath. I'm just going to take this red. So here is the Greek word for wrath, but it basically means exposed to divine punishment. And if you guys have any questions, you can definitely type them and I'll answer them as we go along. Next is rich. The Greek word for rich is here, but it basically means abundantly, sub um, abundantly supplied and abounding. And 
then we have dead. Here's a Greek word for dead, but it means spiritually dead, destitute of life that recognizes and is devoted to God, given up to trespasses and sins. The next word is gift. That was terrible. <laughs> but I th here's the Greek word for gift, and it just means present. We have workmanship. Here's a Greek word for that, and it means that which was made, a thing that is made or created by God. So I'm just going to write a thing that was, sorry, that is created or made by God. And the last one is going to be walk, which this is the Greek word for walk, and it basically means to live conduct oneself, regulate one's life. I'm just going to go in with some colors. Just to brighten everything up. Now going back to verse 1 and starting to underline things. So it says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. I'm going to underline that whole verse. And basically we were all once dead, meaning we didn't know or acknowledge God and once in our lives. Um, and that we need to never forget where we came from and where we started and how we were converted. Um, we were blind, we were slaves to sins, we were lovers of darkness, we were sick, we were lost, we were strangers, we were children of wrath, we were under the power of darkness. So I think that's just a great reminder to to show us and remind us that we were not always, you know, wholly sanctified and, you know, saved. Um, we always came, sorry, not we always, but we all came from a point of um, darkness and lowliness and stuff like that. So I think this is something that most people tend to forget when they become saved. Um, especially older people in the church, they tend to be quick at um, condemning someone. And I feel like people need to just remember that you were once dead in your trespasses. You were once a slave to whatever you were, was a slave to, whether it be sexual sin, whether it be drugs, whether it be any type of um, anything that was an abomination to God. Someone was once uh, a slave to that. And many people forget that. So that's something that I think everyone needs to remember. So I'm going to mark that. I'm going to say all were dead. 
remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Because some people tend to act like they've always been wholly sanctified and all that, but that's not the case at all. Everyone has a past, and it's not always going to be a past full of light. There is just not. Good morning, Tanya. And I know I did forget to um, upload <laughs> the first chapter onto YouTube. I did download it yesterday, so I'm just going to upload chapters 1 and 2 on YouTube Monday. Because I totally forgot. Not even going to lie. Totally forgot to do that. But um, chapter 1 and chapter 2 will be uploaded on Monday to YouTube. Moving on to verse 2, it says, Once walked following the course of this world. So I'm going to underline that. I actually need to switch my pens because I'm using the wrong pen. So, um, I was using a medium, but I need to be using the fine, which is this one, which is why I'm trying to figure out why my ink looks different. So, yeah, switching pens quickly. Um, so, once walked following the course of the world. Basically, there was a time when sinfulness basically defined who we were and that fleshly desires controlled our every being. Our old selves were comfortable in sin. And that a dead man feels comfortable in his coffin, but if we were made alive, I'm sorry, if he were made alive, he would instantly feel suffocated and comfortable. I'm sorry, uncomfortable. Let me grab my nook. Because I have scriptures to read. I'm going to repeat all that again because I felt like I just said all that wrong. But, um, okay, so once walked following the course of this world... I'm going to say that there was a time when sinfulness defined us. And again, um, we were comfortable in our sin with our old selves. And an analogy for that is that a dead man feels comfortable in his coffin because he's dead. But if he were made alive, he would instantly feel suffocated and uncomfortable. So what I mean by that is that when we were dead in our sins, we were comfortable with that. But the minute we recognize who God is and all that he is to us, we begin to feel uncomfortable with our sinful ways and the things that we did. So the cross reference I have for that is Philippians 3.18. And I'm going to read that. And I'm not going to read all the cross references out loud. But Philippians, where are you? Philippians 3.18. And I'm reading it in the New King James translation. But it says, for many of whom I have told you often now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ and 2nd Timothy 4 and 10 if this works properly hold on Good morning, Maria. <laughs> okay. Um. And y'all, I'm still trying to get used to recording again these live sessions. So yeah, bear with me. <laughs> um. Okay. The next part is following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at the work and the sons of disobedience. So basically, this is telling us that Satan is still very much active among those in rebellion against God. In sin, we respond to Satan's guidance. We are not responding to God. So I'm going to underline all of that. And where am I going to write it? I'm going to write all the way in this little corner here. If I can. 
um, Satan Alive. Among Rebellious. So I'm just going to write that Satan is alive among the rebellious people. He's very much active. And a lot of people, you know, they say Satan isn't real, but he definitely is real. Um, anything that goes against God is the work of Satan. Period. I mean, it's just as simple as that. And it doesn't have to be Satan himself. He does have his own little, you know, entourage, if you will. Going to verse 3, it says, among whom we all once lived. So I'm going to underline that. And this is basically telling me that we were all once unbelievers. Um, once an unbeliever. And I mean, I don't care if you grew up in a Christian household or not. I grew up in a Christian household. I've been in church all my life and I was a hot mess. So we all were once unbelievers. We were all once in sin regardless. I'm trying to get all this on this page because I don't feel like using a post-it. Sorry about my hand. Um, then it says carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And basically in our sinful state, we fell to the cravings of our flesh and that we were looking at carnal things alone. We were embracing the perversions and were carnal minded. So where am I going to write this? <laughs> Trying to keep space, but, um. I'm going to write carnal minded. Embraced. Perversions. I probably just spelled that wrong, but I don't care. We're just going to keep going with it. I definitely spelled that wrong, if I'm not mistaken. I think I did. I don't know. But, yep. Gonna use gray for that. And then it says, We're by nature children of wrath. So, we're by nature children of wrath. And basically, this tells me that we rightfully deserve God's wrath because we, I'm sorry, because of who we were in heritage. Um, the minute that Adam and Eve send it ushered in death among us um and that's why you need jesus to realize who god is and all that but we rightfully deserved his wrath but now that we have jesus we don't have that wrath if that makes sense so rightfully deserved his wrath Going to verse 4, it says, God being rich in mercy. So I'm going to underline that. And basically, he has an abundance of compassion and forgiveness for us, and it's 100% pure and unchanging. Um, he's always going to be there to forgive us, but that does not mean that we should continually sin. You know, he's, he's a God of mercy. He's a God of compassion, a God of love. So um, he has an abundance. I'm going to write this. He has an abundance of pure, unchanging, compassion. 
compassion, and forgiveness. This is getting out of hand on this page with these markings, but that's okay. Then it says the great love with which he loved us. Basically, um, it's extraordinary and ex eternal love that extends to all. So... His love is not like our love because humans are very fickle and we're very emotional people. God loves us and will continue to love us even when we sin. He loves us. Sometimes when somebody makes you angry, you don't love that person. You don't talk to that person. So, you know, God definitely has a different type of love than we do. His love is eternal. And sometimes, a lot of the times, you even see that in marriages now, um, people will say that they love each other and then divorce the next minute. So, you know eternal love that extends to all let's get some green on this page i have no green here Okay. So verse 5, it says, even when we were dead in our trespasses. So I'm going to underline this. I'm going to use pink. So even when we were dead in our turn the page. Can you guys see this clearly? Dead in our trespasses made us alive. I'm going to also underline together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. So starting with the even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive. So God loved us even when we should have been unlovable. And he gave his son to make us new creatures. And let me finish underlining that. Hold on. He loved us even when we should have been unlovable. gave us life gave us life in our dead bodies so because of his love he gave us new life what did I say that right <laughs> yeah because of his love he gave us new life yeah I said that right Then it says together with Christ. So this is in harmony with Christ, which reminds us that we cannot do anything that um, is outside of Christ. Because to get to God, you have to be in Christ. You have to be with Christ. Christ has to dwell within you through the Holy Spirit, obviously. But um, this is in harmony, so nothing can be done outside of Christ. So in harmony with Christ... Then it says, by grace, you have been sa saved. So saving grace that we did not deserve. None of us deserved saving grace. Um, salvation from spiritual death is God's work for the undeserving. Where am I going to write that? Um, I'll write it over here. So saving grace we did not deserve.
salvation from spiritual death. It's, it's God's work for the undeserving. Good morning, Latoya. I'm going to take this peach. This. Hope you guys can see this clearly. Um, going on to verse 7. It says, Coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So God will never stop dealing with us on the basis of grace and will forever continue to unfold its riches to us through eternity. And that you can read Philippians 4.19 for that. But um, coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So... I will never stop dealing with us. So every day he's revealing new mercies. He's revealing grace to us. He's showing us his grace. He's showing us, um, you know, favor and mercy every single day. And there's a new way that he's unfolding that to us. It's not always going to be in the same manner or the same way. Sorry about that, guys. I had to sneeze. Good morning, Lisa. And I'm trying to write as small as possible <laughs> just because there's a lot of notes to take with Ephesians. Um, so I'm going to use this yellow. Going to verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. So I'm going to underline that. Then it says, Not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So I'm going to also underline that. Not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So we are only, I'm sorry, saved only by grace that comes by our faith. There is no other way for us to be saved um like at all you need to have faith you need to trust in christ you need to know who christ is you have to have a relationship with christ and in doing that you are then saved i'm going to write that sideways um and what i mean by that is obviously there's nothing that you can do there's no work that you can do there's no kindness that you can show to someone there's nothing that you can pay for like it's a gift from god but it comes through christ so saved only by grace that comes by faith sorry I had to just write that sideways um let's nope I use the color gonna use a twistable pencil now
It says, not your own doing. It is a gift of God. So the work of salvation is God's gift that we don't deserve. Um... Work of salvation is an undeserved gift. Because again, by right, we should be dealt the wrath of, of God. But because of our relationship with Christ, he now gives us the gift of grace, favor, mercy. Verse 9, it says, not a result of works. So I'm going to underline that. So basically, salvation has nothing to do with our own accomplishment. Um, God alone receives the glory for it. So it has nothing to do with us. It's nothing for us to be prideful about. It's nothing for us to tell others about um how we ourselves got salvation because it has nothing to do with us it is simply something that god alone receives the glory for and something that he does that we don't deserve and again the whole idea of chapter two is that it's undeserved it's only through christ that we receive salvation it's only through christ that we receive grace and mercy and kindness and love but um not love because god loves us regardless but <laughs> You know, it has nothing to do with what we do. It's all about God and himself and our relationship with Christ that brings us to this newness, this new life, this this uh, new grace and new mercies that we receive. So I'm going to put God alone. Receives glory. And as you can see, Bible journaling can definitely get messy, but I think that's the part that I love about it is because it's so messy for me writing my notes and breaking things down and studying. I think that's what I love the most about it. Okay. Going on to verse 10. So it says, for we... Are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared I'm gonna underline that then it says beforehand that we should walk in them so I just took that entire verse and broke it down into three parts so the first part is for we are his workmanship the second part is created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared. And then the last part is going to be beforehand that we should walk in them. So I'm actually going to need a post-it for this one. I'm actually going to use this. So I'm just going to put verse 10. Let's get some color going. Sorry about that, guys. My fiance is here <laughs> and his phone just rung. If you guys heard him, but um, I'm going to take this mint here. Okay. So, the first part it says, For we are his workmanship. So, he saves us because we are his work of art. We are created by him for his purposes. Um, God didn't create us just to. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just reading the comments. Yes, Tanya. Yes, yes, yes. And a lot of people tend to forget that like they really do. But um, yeah, God created us um, 
with his hands. I mean, obviously, he created Adam and Eve. Everything else he spoke into existence. But when it came to humans, when it came to Adam and Eve, he actually crafted them with his hand and with his own breath. So we are his work of art, but we were created by him for his purpose. And a lot of people feel like they were born to do whatever they please. They feel like they have the freedom to do what they want. And though he gives us choices, the real choice that we really how can I say this? Um, he gives us the choice to do what we want, but in actuality, we were created for a specific purpose, you know? So it's kind of like cell phones. Um, cell phones were created specifically to communicate via phone call, but we use them for different things. We use them to email, we use them to text, we use them to play games, we use them to take pictures. But I mean, back in the day, phones weren't like they are now. They were created for one specific purpose, and that's to call someone to communicate with them. I'm sorry, Tanya. I don't understand 110, sin and salvation. Oh, you mean verses 1 through 10. Yeah. Um, Basically, let me see what they called it. Uh, where is it? They basically, in um for chapter 2, they titled ver the section for verses 1 through 10, by grace through faith. But um, you can think of it like that as well, sin and salvation, yeah. But they titled it Grace Through Faith, which I think is um, a good reminder. Yeah, so hopefully that made you, that makes sense, what I just said. <laughs> Hi, Angela. Let me know if that just made sense, what I said, Tanya. <laughs> but yeah, um, they call it Grace Through Faith. But yeah, you can think of it the same way. Um, sin and Salvation. So what I was saying for verse 10. Oh, okay. Um, we are his work of art created by him for his purpose. Then it says, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him, in them. I'm sorry, guys. This is actually all one. <laughs> That's actually all one underline. So, um. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in in them. So basically, we were created to do good works. We were not created to sin. We were not created to self-indulge. We were not created to make other people happy. We were not created to make ourselves happy. We were created to do good works. Um, and good works are valid evidence that we are walking as his chosen people. So... The question that I have is, are we doing good works? Like, that's, a, I think that's a question that we really need to ask ourselves, if not daily, every week. Um, what good works have I done? And it's not always about, you know, have I been nice to someone or, you know, did I speak encouragement? Because that, those are good, you know, those are good works. But I, for me, I think in terms of the, uh, sp fruit of the spirit, sorry. I think in terms of fruit of the spirit. So, it, it's hard to explain. Um, let me see if I have another thing of notes. No, I don't for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain. Good works is like something else that we can just study on its own because not many people understand what good works are. And I can't access my phone right now because I'm using it to record. So I'm probably going to have to do like a separate video and just talk about good works, um, what they are. But you know, we were created to do good works. We were not created to sin. We were not created to do whatever we want. Though we have the choice to do that, God does not desire for us to do whatever we want to do. He desires for us to do his purpose, to do his good works, and to live accordingly, if that makes sense. So I'm going to say, created to do good works. that are valid evidence of 
of living as his chosen because we we defined what walk means and we understand that walk means to live as to conduct ourselves or to regulate our lives so are we regulating our lives so that it's evident that we are doing good works that have to align with his purpose does that make sense i'm hoping this makes sense because it makes sense in my head but saying it out loud i feel like i'm not making any sense <laughs> but um living as his chosen so i'm going to stick this on the back of this post-it here yes that that's basically what i'm saying maria <laughs> yeah like the good works it, it there's so many things because it tells us in the bible exactly what we were what we were created for but it can really all be summed up into good works. We were created to glorify him. We were created to worship him. We were created to help expand the kingdom of God. We were created to um, be fishers of men, as Jesus said to, who was that, Peter? I think he said that to Peter. Um, you know, we were created for a specific purpose, to do good works. Like, it's, it's, hard, to <laughs> it's hard to explain. But yeah, definitely that's exactly what I'm saying, Maria. You know, to glorify him, to bear fruit. Um, to keep our faith, um, you know, to communicate with him, to have a relationship with him and his son, to be in constant relationship, you know, not just have basic relation, but to be in relationship because that's what we were created for. Yes. Felt, yes. That's another one. Fellowship with him. Like good works. It, it's, it, it encompasses all that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Okay, so now verses 11 to 22. Is this right? Yes, to make disciples. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so now for verses 11 to 22, they call it one in Christ. So I'm going to read it through, circle words, underline, make my notes, and I have this note here because what was I doing? I think it was, I think her name was Jordan Dooley. I think that's her name. Can't remember, and I can't remember her Instagram account right now. Soul Scripts. Okay, yeah. So I did one of her Soul Script videos, and this had to go with Romans. I think. Let me just see. I feel like that went with Romans, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry, guys. I just want to see. Yeah, it did because I had notes. So yeah, that pay that no mind like this just pay it no mind <laughs> that went with a different study but um okay so starting at verse 11 it says therefore remember that at one time you gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands remember that you are at i'm sorry remember that you were at that time separated from christ alienated from the commonwealth of israel and strangers to the covenant of the promise having no hope and without god in the world but now in christ jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of christ verse 14 for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that we might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through Christ, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached good sorry, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. And members of the household of God. Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together. Grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together. Into a dwelling place. For God by the spirit. So in essence this is saying how the Gentiles. And the chosen people. The Jews are now no longer two different entities they're now one because of christ jesus we are now one in christ um and that's pretty much what it's saying so now i'm going to circle words that i want to define so the first one i circled will be remember going to verse 
12 I have without God and apparently that is one kind of phrase that was defined when I looked it up in the Greek going to verse 15 we have abolishing reconcile in verse 16 and then access in verse 18 so there's remember without God abolishing reconcile and access so Just circling now so that I know what colors are which. Okay. So the first word is remember. The Greek word for remember is here, and it means to hold in memory, to keep in mind. So, to hold in memory, keep in mind, we then have without God, and that's more of a phrase. But here is the Greek word for that. And it means godless, ungodly, one who neither knows nor worships the true God. So. Godless. Ungodly. One who neither. Knows or oh. Worships the true God. Abolishing. I just looked up the English definition for that. I didn't feel the need to look up the Greek. Um, so for that, it just means formally put an end to. We have reconcile. Reconcile, the Greek is there. So, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. But it means bring back to a former state of harmony. So, bring back to former states of harmony. And access is the last word. The Greek word is here, but it means to basically have access to God. It's a friendly relationship with God whereby we are acceptable to him and have assurance that we, I'm sorry, that he is favorably disposed toward us. Okay, I just had to write that down. So all I'm going to do now is just box it all off with these colors. Sorry about that. Sound reconcile was in this color.
I think access was in pink. Okay. So I have everything there. I'm just going to stick this sticky note over here for now. Out of the way. So we can get to the notes. Let me just fix this. I got all this stuff in the way. So it says in verse 11, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh. So I'm going to underline that. And basically God's, God's work of reconciliation is not only between God and the individual, but also groups that are at odds. So... Not only between, and what I mean by that, I mean like you can even look at religious groups. I don't think uh, Baptist people and Catholic people and Christians really need to be arguing, you know, and a lot of the times that is the case. Um, you will find some Catholic people try to condemn a Baptist or a Baptist trying to condemn a Christian who you know, it's non-denominational, you know, I don't, I don't think that's what it should be about, it should all be about Christ and God, but unfortunately, it's not, <laughs> not in the day and age that we live in, okay, this was terrible writing, yep, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go with it and say that I understand exactly what I wrote, because I don't, <laughs> That is terrible. Oh, God. That is terrible. Terrible. Terrible handwriting. Okay. Did you guys even see that? No. Clearly. <laughs> so, here it is. Sorry about that. Um... Going to verse 12. You were at that time separated from Christ. You were at that time separated from Christ. And then I'm also going to underline having no hope and without God in the world. Which is towards the bottom. Having no hope and without God in the world. So you were at... You were at that time separated from Christ. Basically, our dead states and our fleshly manners kept us away from Christ. There were no spiritual blessings. There was no light. There was no peace. There was no rest. There was no safety. There was no hope or a savior. Um, we were dead. We were comfortable in sin. We were indulging in sin. We were lustful. And when I say lustful, I don't just mean sexual. I mean, like, we were longing for things that pleased our bodies. Whether that be food, whether that be alcohol, whether that be drugs, um, whether that be, you know, dressing a certain way. You know, we were into those things and that kept us separated from Christ because Christ does not dwell within that type of environment. So, um, our dead states... ...and fleshly manners... kept us away from Christ. Then having no hope and without God in the world, spiritually dead, which means we had no access to God, period. Um, when you're spiritually dead, there is no relationship there. Um, and because there's no relationship, you are now spiritually dead. But to get that relationship, you need Christ. <laughs> and if you're separated from Christ, you therefore have no relationship with God, which now makes you spiritually dead. And being spiritually dead is not a pleasing thing. I know for me, I have been spiritually dead. <laughs> um, you guys will see in the testimony series, like, I, I have not, I, yeah, there have been moments when I've seen darkness. There has moments, have been moments where I didn't feel safe. Um, you know, there, there was just nothing there. I feel like I personally was spiritually dead. I 
separated myself from Christ because I was into, you know, smoking weed or having sex or, you know, hanging out with the wrong crowd that didn't allow for uh, a gateway for Christ to come to me. And I read something the other day. Um, let me grab it because I feel like it was such something so profound that um, it really just hold on I'm sorry you guys I'm actually looking in this book right now for it because it was really good um okay so I am currently reading this book it's called running from mercy by Anthony J Carter um and it's about Jonah and I'm reading this even though I already did the Jonah notes but it's so good if you definitely need a book on Jonah to study this one is so good it breaks it down so well but um he talks about how um let me show you guys this is like totally off track but i feel like it relates um he says that he comes to you and in coming to you you are allowed to come to him jesus basically made himself available to them them being us and that we don't come to jesus unless jesus first comes to us so you know going back to how it says you were at that time separated from christ i never left a gateway open for Christ to have access to me, which then didn't allow me to be able to go to him um, because it was hard for me to go to him. In order for you to go to Christ, Christ has to first come to you to give you that that path, if you will, to get to him. Hopefully that makes sense. I know that was like totally random, <laughs> but I felt like it related to what we're like studying right now. But yeah. Um, okay, so yeah. Having no hope <laughs> and without God in the world is basically saying that we were spiritually dead and had no access to God. Yes, son, and thank God for grace and mercy. I say it every day. That's always a part of my, <laughs> my prayer is I, I thank him for new mercies and new grace because... Whew, yeah, we all have those, though, we all had that past that we just were, were grateful for not being in anymore. Um, I believe I have a cross reference for that. Um, let me see. Yeah, so the cross reference I have for that is 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, and then I believe this one. Let me just check it. Yeah, so 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13 is one of the cross-references that I have. And I'm not going to always read the cross-references because, again, I do want people to still study the book of Ephesians on themselves, um, for themselves. Um, I always say read the chapter beforehand and take your notes beforehand. That way you're personally doing the study on your own. You can even do it after the fact just to verify what I'm saying if you want. But just find a, a way to study study the chapters on your own i'm i'm like always for that like i watch a lot of sermons and stuff but even after i watch the sermons i go and dissect the scriptures that they mention for myself just because um it allows me to just learn more on my own instead of someone just giving it to me hopefully that made sense but <laughs> all right so let's underline we are almost done It's 11.05. I don't know why I always say an hour when I know that I'm going to always go over an hour. Yeah. So basically, it would be like an hour and a half session because they always end about 11.30. So I just need to keep that in mind for myself because I always say an hour and it never works out. Um, but we're almost done. Going to verse 13. Um, it says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off... So I'm going to underline that now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, um, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So now in Christ Jesus, you who are far off, um, you who were once far off, we were once far away from him because of sinfulness. We were spiritually poor. So that's really all I'm going to write is spiritually poor. I don't even know where I'm going to write this at. <laughs> um, I'll squeeze it here. Spiritually poor. Oopsie. 
And really, this last part is just reminding us that, um, you know, again, we were once in a dead state. And now that we are in Christ, we are alive. That's pretty much all chapter two is reiterating in various ways. It's literally saying the same thing over and over. So that for that, basically, we were once spiritually poor. And this says, have been brought near by God. Sorry, <laughs> have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So we are now close to him because of his sacrificial death. Close because of. For he himself is our peace, which is here, broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. Again, pay the yellow highlight, no mind, okay? <laughs> I'm going to use orange for this. And purple for that. So, for he himself is our peace. Um... Peace is not just a thing to obtain. Peace is an actual person, and that person is Christ Jesus. So, peace is a person. We need to understand that. Peace is not a thing. It's a person. Peace is Jesus. That's pretty much all I'm going to write. Then it says, broken down. Oops, sorry. <laughs> broken down. In his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. So by his blood, he made us a unified um, a unified being. There is no longer a barrier between God and individuals, nor between groups of people. The wall that he's talking about, that dividing wall of hostility, was basically the law. And his flesh and blood broke that dividing wall through a new covenant. So that old covenant, the laws, they were basically a wall that divided the people. And even though it divided the Gentiles from the Jews, it also divided the Jews within themselves because not everyone could abide by those laws. And I mean, there were a lot of laws, not just the Ten Commandments. There were plenty of laws. And I think I mentioned this when we studied um, chapter one. Everyone cannot abide by those laws because if you break one law, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter how many laws you live by. If you break one simple law you are a sinner but through christ um having his flesh torn apart through his blood being um spilled for us that wall has been now broken and now there is no more hostility i'm gonna have to write this on a post-it note because i have no space so by his blood He made us all one. The law was the wall. His blood broke that wall. Verse 15, it says, creating himself one man in the place of two, so making peace. Basically, Christ satisfies the law, so now the Gentiles and the Jews are now one and at peace in Christ. Christ. 
Christ satisfies. the law now bringing Jews and gents as one and peace in him Sixteen, it says, might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. I'm going to write that on this post-it. Um, basically, all are brought together into one body, which is the church. Unity in Christ is far greater than differences. So... And we are down to the last four verses that I'm going to break down. Sorry, I'm just fixing my notes. So verse 18, it says, Through him we have both access in one spirit to the Father. Basically, you can only have... Um, can only access God by one means and not several. No person has greater access to God than the next. And you access him through the spirit. You receive the spirit through Christ. And what I mean, I don't mean that, um, how can I say this? Because <laughs> I know someone's going to find it ridiculous what I just said. But I don't mean that, you know, you can't pray or you can't access God through studying the Bible. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that um, outside of Christ, there is no access to God. Um, there just isn't. And even though it says one spirit, you get that spirit through Christ because Christ even said that he has to leave and that the father will bring a comforter he'll bring someone to us so that someone is the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit comes by way of Christ and through Christ you get to God so hopefully that makes sense because I know somebody is gonna say oh that's wrong I'm, I'm hoping hopefully I'm breaking that down so you guys understand <laughs> I'm not saying that you know yeah I, I, I just hope it makes sense because <laughs> I know somebody's gonna say something especially on YouTube when I post this up so hopefully that makes sense um, the cross references I have for verse 18 are going to be Romans 8.26 and then Hebrews 9 and 8. All right, verse 19, it says, No longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So actually, you could really just bracket or circle verse 19, but I'm, I'm difficult, so I felt like, you know, 
underlining the whole thing. And we are all a family in Christ of God. I'm sorry. We are all a family in Christ of God's household because the blood that Christ shed for us. And no one is greater or better than the other. We are all equal in the eyes of God. And that's another thing that I feel like people tend to forget. They tend to forget that everyone in the eyes of God are equal. It doesn't matter how far along in your faith are. It doesn't matter your position in the church. It doesn't matter... How long you been saved? Everyone in the eyes of God is equal. Now, when it comes to sinning, God does expect more of those who have, you know, been saved or in the church longer than, say, a baby Christian, if that makes sense. But we are all equal. No one is better or greater than the next. So all equal. In the eyes of God. No one. Better or greater. Than the next. Verse 20. It says, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Okay, so those on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, basically all built, their, I'm sorry, all built on their revelation. So we have equal ground. Um, the foundation is already set and cannot be changed. So there's, there's no need for us to each individually try to build a foundation. There is already a set foundation that has been established through the apostles and the prophets of the Bible. It's in scripture. So everything in scripture is our foundation. We don't need to go out of our way to make um, our own personal foundations. And a lot of people I know tend to do that. They tend to study scripture to try to create their own foundation. But there's just, it doesn't make sense. This is the manual. This, this is it. Like everything in here is it. There is no need for us to try to create or um, build our own foundation. Everyone has equal foundation. This is it. It's just a matter of how you build on that foundation so you know we have a foundation that's already set and it's already built so foundation set and cannot be changed Then it says Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So basically Christ is the glue that binds us all together to the foundation. Without him, there is no structure. He keeps us stable. We depend on him alone for stability. The church must be supported by him on the foundation. This that has already been created. Where am I going to write this? <laughs> I saw post-it notes everywhere. I'm going to have to write it on its own separate post-it note because I want to write all of that down. So um, this is verse 20. So first, let's do this. So again, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Um... Christ is the glue that binds us all together to 
to the foundation. Without him, there is no structure. He keeps us stable. The church must be supported. by him on the foundation. That has already been created. Let me just double check this cross reference before I, I mention it. <laughs> um, Yeah, so the cross-reference I have for this is going to be 1 Peter 2 and 6. And that basically says, um, Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So that chief cornerstone is Christ. And then finally, skipping verse 21 and going to 22, it says, In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let me just check this quickly. Good morning, Tanya. We have a lot of Tanyas in the group. <laughs> well, good morning. Okay, so yeah, again, verse 22, it says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for, this, for God by the Spirit. So God prepares us first and then fits us into his building. Um, and basically the cross-reference I have for that is going to be Hebrews 3 and 6. And it says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence in the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end so god is preparing us first to then be able to fit into his building um and that building that house is going to be christ um if that makes sense again the cross reference is going to be hebrews three and six i'm just gonna say god prepares then fits And that is it. My highlighters are getting messed up, which sucks because I really like these highlighters. Oh. But yeah. Yeah, my highlighter's messed up. Oh no. That sucks. That was random. Pay that in mind, guys. But yeah, so I'm going to stick all these sticky notes back on my pages. This one was from chapter one. This is for chapter two. Chapter two has extra sticky notes everywhere. So yeah, I'm definitely going to have to um, put paper like I did for John. Because Ephesians is going to have a lot of notes. <laughs> but um, here are the sticky notes from today. So the definitions here. Um, we have our verse notes here here and here but yeah that is it um an hour and a half so i need to start remembering that these sessions will be an hour and a half and not just an hour because i talk forever but yeah <laughs> um do you ladies have any questions before i sign off any questions concerns oops let me move that out the way Um, if you do, you can always just comment in the group. Um, I know I haven't been as active, and a few of you know why, what's been going on um, with my family. But, um, yeah, I still try to...
find the questions. <laughs> so I'm probably going to post up a announcement kind of post where you ladies can just leave your questions and stuff about Ephesians. Um, but yeah. Okay, let's go. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> okay, Tanya. You too, Latoya. I hope you all enjoy your day. And um, tomorrow we will, tomorrow Saturday, right? Yeah, tomorrow we will have a live discussion for the Ruth Anointing book. Probably about the same time as I did last time, or probably 10. I will let you ladies know before the evening is over. But yes, this session, so chapters 1 and chapter 2 will be posted to YouTube Monday. For sure. I am actually going to download this video later on today and then edit it so that it can all be uploaded. You too, Caroline. Caroline. Is it Caroline or Caroline? Lisa, um, for the Bible study or for Ruth? Ruth, I do on Saturdays. Um, and then the Bible studies are on Fridays. So I'm going to go live again tomorrow. Kind of like how we did last Saturday <laughs> discussing the book and probably having a random discussion afterwards have a great weekend Tanya okay okay <laughs> okay ladies thank you so much again I hope you ladies have a great day have a great weekend and I'll see you tomorrow if you join me for the live <laughs> so I'll catch you guys later bye